Okay, so uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I am Andre Pazin, and I am one of the organizers of the Quantum Clair um, Lab in 2024. And today, uh, the purpose of this uh, small tutorial is for you to understand how to use uh, our infrastructure. And um, also, we will cover the couple, a couple of examples that we uh, provided in your uh, workspaces um, so that it will be easier for you to get uh, started and uh, working with your own uh, ideas. So uh, let's start by sharing the screen. Okay, so screen should be visible right now. Uh, I'm going to start with a brief presentation uh, that uh, is also available in the uh, QCLA um, website. In fact, you can find the website here. So uh, we have, this is our website. So qcla.dai.unipd.it. Here you can find all the information that you need to participate, our tasks and so on. Um, basically, uh, if you go in this section here, which is ECIR 2024 tutorial, uh, you can see um, that uh, last month we basically uh, did a tutorial at the ECIR conference and uh, below here at the um, bottom of this web page, you can find uh, the materials that we used. So if you want also to have a look at how quantum works, how quantum computing works, and uh, how to formulate Cubo problems and uh, this kind of stuff. You can go through the PDFs that are available uh, right here. And in this case, we are going to go through briefly uh, the hands-on part in which we present the infrastructure and how it works. So. Uh, in this really brief presentation, we're going to talk about why it's important to have our infrastructure and uh, how it, um, how does it work. Uh, so, and finally, we're also going to talk about how to access the web application and how to access uh, your own workspaces that are available right now. So uh, having a customized infrastructure is of course uh, really important in our case. And we will see uh, really sh uh, briefly why and which are the main key aspects of having this custom infrastructure. So first of all, uh, the Quantum Clay Lab, of course you already know uh, what's about, what it is about. And uh, we uh, want to basically use quantum computing and especially in this case, quantum annealing uh, to target some problems that are uh, commonly found in uh, uh, tasks such as uh, in, uh, sorry, in, um, in the recommendation uh, system and the information access fields. And these problems in particular uh, that we are interested in are feature selection and clustering. And basically uh, these problems are quite computationally expensive and we want to understand whether applying quantum computing can actually help in uh, uh, boosting the efficiency or, um, and the effectiveness of, the, of uh, systems involving uh, these approaches. Actually, with the current state of the art of quantum computers, what we are more interested in is to actually understand whether it is possible to apply quantum computing to solve these tasks, since it is likely that in the future, uh, we will have uh, more performing hardware that will allow us to target more realistic problems and to uh, even uh, outperf uh, outperform in some of these problems in classical hardware. So, in this case, our infrastructure is needed for uh, these main aspects here. We will start with problem submissions. And the idea is that uh, you will work basically with real quantum devices, with real quantum anillers during, during this lab. And therefore, um, I, we, we do not uh, we do not own these quantum devices, and um, they are basically scattered around the world in some data centers. 
And uh, these devices are pro uh, provided by the company D-Wave. Um, to access these devices, you need to have some API keys. And uh, uh, basically, each API key is associated to a given amount of time per month that can be used to uh, sub, uh, send some problems to make some submissions to quantum leaders. And uh, we have our own API key, but we cannot, uh, this, can, this cannot be disclosed with other people. And therefore, um, our infrastructure uh, manages, uh, uh, in our infrastructure, we try to hide this API key and to hide uh, and to uh, allow you to work with our own API key without you, uh, without having you to know this API key. So basically, this is one of the most important aspects. Second, second key aspect is, of course, reproducibility and fairness. Uh, because what we have in our infrastructure is that, um, I mean, let's start from at the beginning. So in several um, several papers, several uh, basically in all fields, uh, researchers tend to use like some uh, their own machines, of course, what they have at their own disposition. But uh, in these cases, we are not um, not only interested in effective in effectiveness, but also in efficiency. Uh, this uh, is not really good for reproducibility. In fact, having different machines uh, mean, means that uh, they have different computational power and therefore can, uh, this can impact the, the overall execution time of an, an algorithm, of course. And therefore, what we want to do, to what we want to have is to create some uh, uh, the same workspace for each one of the participating team uh, such that each one, uh, each, uh, each one of you will have the same exact environment, the same exact resources, so that um, all the results will be comparable. And uh, basically that's it. So we will make use of Kubernetes to provide you the same computational resources and to make uh, all the results that we will have at the end as, um, as, as, as good as possible in terms of reproducibility. Finally, we also want to have everything as simple as possible. Uh, many people are scared about quantum computing and uh, this is uh, an additional layer, let's say, of uh, fear that can be added on top of, the, of having a custom infrastructure that you never used. But uh, actually what we want to have is a really, really simple infrastructure that lets you, you uh, start right without uh, without knowing every, uh, anything about it in fact what we you will see is that uh, or what you should have already seen is that everything is basically uh, available directly from the browser so you can code from the browser you just need an internet connection and everything will just be fine um, you do not have to own a really powerful laptop because you will work inside our own servers, which are uh, hosted in Amazon. Um, and therefore, that's basically it. So you do not have to worry about the infrastructure. You just have to worry about quantum computing. But as we will see uh, shortly, uh, the problems that we're going to tackle uh, in this first year of quantum clay are actually pretty uh, easy in this sense. Uh, and we are, mm, the quantum annealing paradigm is not as complex as it might uh, seem, since most of uh, the tools that, we, that you will use are already provided by D-Wave. Basically, what you will have to do is just to formulate some problems uh, in, a, in a given way, so in, with a specific format, so that they are suitable to be solved uh, using quantum monitors. So briefly, how does the infrastructure work? And um, basically, uh, the infrastructure is like this. So. Uh, you can, we have a web application that is accessible uh, from anyone on the internet, of course. And this web application will provide you uh, information about tasks uh, and statistics and the access to your own workspaces. Um, 
actually the workspace that you will have, which are the ones that we just talked about, uh, can be accessed always um, through HTTPS. And the idea is that you will have at your own disposition just the your favorite browser, such as Chrome, or Firefox, or whatever. And uh, once you log in in our um, in your workspace, you will have a user interface that is pretty similar to the Visual Studio Code IDE. And this, this is an IDE that is used by many researchers. It is an open source free IDE. And uh, there, therefore, uh, it should be pretty easy for, for you to, to get used to it, or you might uh, be already familiar with that. Then in the works, the workspaces uh, can uh, from your workspace you can solve some problems and basically when you solve a problem and you want to solve a problem when you want to solve a problem, uh, you want to submit it to the quantum annealer which is located somewhere uh, outside so in a data center like, uh, most likely, and what you have what you do is simply to send a request to our dispatcher which is basically a let's say a proxy that um, uh, 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 attaches the, uh, our own API key in, a, in the correct way so that the problem will be solvable uh, by the quantum annealer. So once it is solved, we will get back the results and will be reported to your, uh, your own team, but also we will have some uh, uh, database that is updated uh, with the results and with your submission and with how much time uh, with you basically uh, used for your own submission so that uh, each one of you will have a fixed amount of time and uh, we won't have we will not have problems uh, in uh, um, going over the quotas that we have. So from your own perspective, what it looks like is what I just said. So you uh, you can access and we will access it in a really, really uh, few seconds. And basically you have this interface that resembles the Visual Studio Code ID, as we just said, and you can use Python and Jupyter Notebooks uh, as you prefer. It's you can do whatever you want in, in this case. Uh, you need to use Python, by the way, because uh, the, I mean, you can also try to implement, of course, your own API. Uh, you, you can also uh, the, try to implement your own APIs in other languages, but I mean, everything in our infrastructure will work in Python and the official libraries are in Python. So uh, this is a good, way also for you to know how to use quantum annealers and a good way to practice this, um, how to, pra to practice uh, using them also for the future, maybe if you will use them in, in the next years for other projects. And you will use, as I just said, the official D-Wave libraries and we do not have anything different uh, from the official D-Wave libraries, so everything is the same. So everything that you learn can be used also later on. The only thing that changes is that you just have to import our own package uh, that basically allows us to uh, monitor your submissions in a, in a sense. Um, uh, but as you can see, it is basically the same as in a normal uh, submission. So using a normal quantum, so if you want to perform a normal submission using quantum annealers, you can just, uh, for example, uh, have this little piece of code. If you translate it in our infrastructure, you just have to import our library and just call a function qa.submit to submit according to the sampler that you chose. So the simulated annealing sampler in this case, and the function that you want to use because each sampler has several functions that is the same. And we also require you to put um, uh, uh, the number of the task that you're uh, making the submission for. So for if you're working on feature selection, you will have to put the lay as uh, the first uh, the, the, the first characters in the label, which means the, uh, let's say a sort of, description of your uh, submission, uh, you have to put the number of the tasks you're participating in. So feature selection is number one, clustering is number two. 
And accessing the web application is not so complicated. Basically, we provided you the credentials already. You just have to, uh, to, uh, to like type the, your email address and the password that we sent you, and you will be good to go. Uh, you will also have the possibility to inspect problems with the D-Wave Inspector tool, uh, which is another tool provided by D-Wave that allows you to really see how the qubits have been, let's say, uh, how, how all the qubits uh, have been chosen inside of the QPU, the quantum processing unit, how your variables that you had in your original problems have been mapped to these qubits and uh, how the, those qubits are linked together uh, to find the final solution of your own problem. And the, the, the different solutions, for example, are reported here on the right. So, Let's go on. Okay, so now I think we are fine. And yeah, just a couple of references, but it's not important. So let's just stop sharing the screen. Okay, so. Um, okay. So if you want to log in in our infrastructure, what you have to do is just go on the internet and to type quantumclad.com. And here you will reach our infrastructure. In this case, I'm already logged in, but I will log out. So to log in with your own credentials, of course, it's really simple. Just press login, use your own email and the password that uh, was associated to your own uh, um, uh, account when we sent you the, the, the emails with the credentials. Once you log in, it's, uh, it looks like this. Oh, maybe I'm not sharing the screen, of course. So let me just do it once again. Share the screen. OK, sorry. Um, let me do it once again. So as I was saying a few seconds ago, OK, so here. You, here, uh, if you go to quantumcloud.com, you can see our website. And if you go here, you can just click on login, type the email that we provided you and the password. Once you find everything will be okay. Then you go on, if you go on dashboard and workspace, those are the sections that you should be interested in. And basically in, a work, in that dashboard, you can see, uh, for example, the statistics and some uh, things about your profile. In particular, in the statistics section, uh, you can see which tasks you are uh, actively participating in. And uh, here you can see the usage of uh, the quantum computing uh, resources and how many submissions. And here you have the list of the submissions that you performed. And in this case, this is a, a test task that I created just for, uh, for the purpose of showing you how everything is working. But you will be associated to task one, feature selection, task two, clustering, of course. So this is basically how it works from the statistics uh, set, uh, uh, from the statistics page. Then if you go back here, sorry, and you click on workspace, you can access uh, your own workspace. Um, let me. Okay. Uh, if you if if you have not um, already logged in. What you will see is that uh, it, uh, pro, uh, it will ask you for a password and the password is the same that you uh, used uh, for logging in when you just press login here at the beginning. So you, you will see a screen telling you to provide a password and you just provide it once again. Okay, so um, in this case, you can see how it looks like in, I, uh, I decided to use the dark mode, but uh, it, you can choose whatever. So you can also customize the, the aspect of uh, your own, uh, um, of your own workspace basically. And 
Here you can see that you have your own workspace. In, the, in your case, you won't have these two things here. You will just have the data sets, which is a shared folder among all you, all of you. And uh, here you can find some examples that we will consider right now and the data sets for each one of the tasks, as you can see. In particular, for task two, we also provide uh, a helper to read the data set just because it is in a strange format, while the other data sets have pretty standard formats. And um, okay, so I guess it's pretty doable. So, uh, okay, let's go on and let's have a look at the examples if it is fine. Uh, so uh, these folders are just readable, so you cannot write there. So what you can do is just uh, copy, for example, this file here. So copy and paste it in your own workspace. So paste. Of course, I already have it. So let me just delete it. OK. So copy and paste it here. As you can see, now we have our file here. Um, basically, in this submission folder, what you, uh, sorry, just going back uh, uh, here, you have a submission folder, which is the folder that you uh, are going to use when you will just um, send the, the, the submissions uh, uh, um, at the end of your of the challenge. So here you will share your own submissions that we will use to uh, measure the performance of your own systems. And it's pretty easy. So let's have a look firstly at feature selection. So uh, let's close this one and let's go through. This is a notebook that we wrote also for ECIR. And as you will see, we, we have uh, some interesting things, uh, but also some more practical ones. Mm -hmm. So let's go through it uh, shortly. And the idea is pretty simple. So feature selection, uh, as most of you will probably know, is just a task, which uh, is a problem in which we want to uh, find the, I mean, we hope to find the optimal subset of features um, that uh, will uh, allow us to train, for example, a learning model. Uh, for um, this subset of feature, we think it is the best one because, for example, this is the most informative subset of features. Those features do not have noise. And um, this can be actually pretty useful. Uh, for example, if you uh, have a training model and the data set is too large and you want to consider just a smaller amount of features because it is too expensive to train a learning model with all these features, or maybe also because um, uh, it, it is not doable at all. So this is why uh, we want to do feature selection. And there are lots of, uh, of systems who work with features, of course. So if you think of machine learning system, but also information retrieval and recommendation systems. But first of all, um, let's also see a little background on quantum computing, of course. And quantum computing is not actually, um, I mean, it's just a different paradigm, but quantum computers are not like some uh, uh, super strange devices. Uh, they are uh, computers that perform some specific, that are used to perform some cal calculations, but leveraging quantum physics rather than normal, let's say, physics. And here we have a, a, a really simple example that I found this, I find it really actually helpful to understand how, what we are actually doing. Um, so, the water tank example. So imagine that you want to, you have a tank and you want to understand how water drains from it. And uh, um, you probably know that to do that with a normal computer, you need to go through fl fluid simulation, uh, which is actually pretty difficult. You have lots of equations, rules, 
and you, mm, simulating how water drains, drains spills from it is actually pretty complex. And therefore, uh, um, you, basically trying to find, to simulate this, uh, uh, the, the water uh, spilling from it, it would be pretty computationally expensive, maybe even slow. And uh, sometimes you might also want to use, for example, some uh, heuristics, approximations, and you cannot really achieve the best accuracy. But what if instead of trying to simulate it, we build it? So the idea is that why don't we exploit the computational power of our fluid? And uh, this is actually pretty interesting because as per, as per se, uh, water, any fluid does not have an inner computational power. But if we are able to create uh, the environment, let's say the, the, the problem to frame the problem, such as the fluid, can actually help in solving it. So the fluid can, in that, in that sense, the fluid can have a computational power. And the idea, in fact, in this case, is just to build a tank. Since building it and then simulating what it is, uh, and then letting the water um, drains from the tank is actually uh, pretty, uh, the, the water drains really accurately. It's I need the, the most accurate results possible. And it takes probably a lower amount of time rather than simulate trying to simulate it with all the possible uh, constraints and factors. And yeah, uh, in, th in that specific sense, we use the, the computational power of fluid, which helped us in understanding how it drains from uh, a tank. And similarly, um, I mean, the results, of course, is that we might even achieve higher efficiency, effectiveness, and sometimes even research savings and intuitiveness. But the idea is the same in the case of uh, quantum computing. So we have really, really small objects, usually, um, which are electrons, photons, atoms. And these objects, as per se, do not have any computational power. But if we are able to make, to create the environment for them to behave such that they can solve some problems uh, with the, um, that, I mean, if we're able to create these environments that represent some problems, so we map some problems to the, uh, to problems that can be solved with these small, really small particles, then uh, we are more powerful than our classical computers. We are, that's basically the idea. So as, as, as if we are able to map a problem uh, to such that it can be solved by quantum computers, then, uh, then we are good to go. This is the, the, the idea of quantum computing. And of course, uh, um, uh, if you go also through the slides, do we um, there are also can be objects which are a little bit uh, let's let's say quantum objects are really really small objects, but also objects that are really cooled down to really really low temperatures, so pretty much to zero absolute uh, to the zero absolute. Okay, after this really small introduction, let's go on with a little bit of uh, the code that we have. And um, okay, so uh, feature selection in its base uh, is an NP hard problem. And uh, uh, if you try to tackle it uh, uh, directly without using any sort of approximations, is Re, uh, it becomes unsolvable just after a few uh, amounts of features. And um, in this case, what we are going to do is to try to solve the specific problem for the Titanic data set, uh, which is a data set that most of you know. It is uh, pretty famous. And it's a data set about Titanic passengers to understand whether, according to the features that we have, we can uh, build a model that can predict whether a passenger survived or not, using, of course, it's, uh, the features that are associated to this passenger. So 
If you want to go through the notebooks, you can just start using it. So just play, uh, just play with that. Uh, if it is the first time, it will uh, ask you to create, for example, uh, to to select which kernel you prefer, as you, as you know for for Jupyter notebooks, and you can just uh, decide whatever you want. In this case, I'm using this version of uh, the this version of Python, and uh, I already set up the kernel, uh, but it is just done in one click basically, so it's not hard at all. In this case, we're also importing the libraries uh, that uh, you do not have, for example, if it is the first time that you are launching, uh, that you are starting working on this project. And other libraries that are not related to uh, to D-Wave uh, over here. So the classical ones such as NumPy, Matplotlib, Pandas, and Scikit-learn. And here we import them, of course. And as you can see, we are also importing onto the, our own library. So here we can access our data set, which is uh, available here. It is here just for the example. And it is the uh, formatted Titanic data set. And you can just start playing with that. So if you run this cell, what it happens is that we read the data set and it prints out how it looks like. So we see all the features that we have and also the target variable that we want to predict, which is survived. So based on all the other features, we want to predict whether a passenger uh, survived or not. So um, as I already told you, uh, feature selection is pretty com a pretty complex problem, is MP hard. So if you want to try to directly tackle it, for example, uh, you would see that you have uh, a really, really high number of uh, possible subset of features. So you can see that it goes on with factorial. Then there are, of course, some approximations for which you can just uh, try to um, uh, enumerate not the factorial, but the binomial of features. And uh, still, it is a uh, really high number of features. And we can exploit quantum computing in this scenario because uh, quantum computing can be helpful, especially in this case of uh, hard problems in the sense that since quant qu with quantum computing, thanks to super to some uh, phenomena such as superposition and entanglement, what we have is that it can help us explore larger spaces. So we can explore exponential number of uh, solutions with a, uh, with a given number of qubits. And uh, theoretically, of course, then in practice, this is not the case because there are some limitations, um, especially, for example, if we want to do some error correct correction techniques in which we have that some qubits are duplicated for um, to for error for error correct or error correction mechanisms. But, this is the, the general idea. So we want to use quantum computing because it can help us solve some tasks more efficiently than uh, uh, normal computing. I want to uh, remind you that classical computers have been uh, developed for decades and quantum computers are just, uh, uh, I mean, at the we are still at the early st early stages of development, so we cannot expect to have uh, uh, some uh, really amazing solutions as of now. But uh, there are, uh, I mean, researchers believe that in a few years, uh, also companies believe that in a few years we will see that quantum computing in some problems actually can uh, uh, make the difference with respect to classical computers. And uh, there are also some papers uh, that you can read about it. So you do not have to know the quantum physics behind it. You can just think that the quantum computer that you will use is just a black box. And as I, as I uh, wrote here, a really cold one since it works approximately uh, close to the is, is zero absolute. Um, zero absolute uh, minus 273 degrees Celsius. And um, yeah, so the idea is that you use it as a black box in which you provide your own problem and it will output a solution for your own problem. And you're basically happy with that. 
And you, of course, you just need to try to see whether it is a feasible solution or not. And that's that's it. So uh, in, um, in our case, uh, what we have is that since we're working with quantum annealing, which is a quantum specific quantum computing power that, that targets uh, some optimization problems only. So it is not a universal uh, quantum, uh, it's not universal quantum computing, which is a more general purpose um, paradigm. In our case, we can use uh, quantum annealing to target optimization problems, but feature selection and clustering can are actually optimization problems, of course, so uh, we can tackle them. And to solve them, uh, we need to formulate our problems in a specific uh, format, according to a specific format, which is also known as the Cubo format or binary quadrat BQM format or Ising format. Those are all interchangeable formats uh, that differ, for example, for uh, from each other just by how the variables are defined. So uh, for example, if the variables can be zero and one or minus one and one, it's they are basically the same um, similar formulations that can be used uh, that from which you can, from one of them, you can just go to the to another formulation uh, just by uh, translating the, the, pro, the, the variables basically. And in our case, the Cuba formulation is something which looks like this. So you have um, uh, this sort of matrix. You can imagine to, that you can just need to formulate your problem as variables that are binary variables uh, that can have values of zero and one. In fact, Cubo stands for quadratic um, unconstrained binary optimization problem. So we have binary variables, zero and one, and optimization because we want to find the optimal solution for a given problem, unconstrained because we cannot uh, set hard constraints, which means that um, we, we will need to find some ways to write our own constraints by using penalties. And uh, there, there can be the possibility that these constraints are not satisfied according to how we choose the penalties, how we can weight these constraints, let's say. Quadratic, because of course, uh, terms are, are quadratic, basically. And um, yeah, so the idea is that once you're able to have this sort of matrix that connects, uh, uh, that uh, represents our problem, so you're good to go. So uh, if you go, sorry, just to make things even more clear, if you go here in this presentation, which is uh, Kiva formulation and minor embedding, you can see for many things about Kiva formulation. And uh, uh, this is how it looks like at the end, just this. Now going back to what we were saying, uh, in our case, what we have is that we can represent the feature selection problem using mutual information between our variables. And this is what we will do uh, right now. So uh, for example, if we are able to uh, formulate the problem such as the uh, diagonal of our matrix uh, is the, um, let's say the, the mutual information between the variables and our target variables, while the other uh, elements are the mutual represented by the mutual information between our um, our target variable between sorry uh, between a, a variable and the conditional mutual information basically, then we can uh, represent our uh, problem as this cubo matrix and we can provide it as uh, with our quantum ideas. Here below, we can find the definition of what is mutual information. But at the end, what we want to do is to quantify how much information we can derive, uh, we, uh, we can get from a variable uh, according to another, basically. So the higher the mutual information, the happier we are in the sense that we would like to keep 
the feature having a higher mutant information with, for example, the feature itself and the target variable. Uh, similar uh, things can be said about conditional mutual information, but and uh, using all these formulas that we provided here, you can find also the functions that compute the Shannon entropy, the conditional Shannon entropy, but these are just uh, things that you can use um, to represent mutual information that we already provided you here. There are um, here you can find a function that uh, creates a BQM, uh, which, it, uh, as I already said, is just a cubo formulation, but with different variables. Let's say so it is still a, it can be seen still as a, um, can be inter they can be used inter in, can be interchanged between one and the other formulations. And we have these functions basically. So if we run this. Um, cell here. Now we have at our disposition all these functions that are used to compute mutual information and also some printing functions to, clear, to print things in a more clear way. So if we go once again back to our data set, now we will try to calculate the mutual information between each one of these variables and the survived variable according to all the rows in our data set. So going back once again, if we run this uh, cell here, we will see the mutual information values between Mr. variable and the survival uh, variable, um, the sex variable and the uh, survival and so on. So these are just mutual information values. You could have used the Pearson coefficient, you could have used several other things to understand the information that is brought uh, for, uh, by a variable to another variable and so on. Mutual information is just an example, but you can play with whatever you want. And that's the, the goal, to try to play with mutual information if you want, but also to try to use other possible formulations, which is the, co the scientific contribution. In fact, the contribution is to find a good formulation, so a good way to uh, formulate our problem, because then solving it is pretty simple and it's straightforward and it's always basically the same exact thing. So the contribution is uh, um, just finding which, how to set the values inside this cubo matrix. And we will see that in a few seconds, uh, how the matrix looks like. So here we just sorted them and we printed once again. Now we can see that from the BQM, we can also build our uh, cubo matrix, as I already told you. And this is how it looks like. So you have that uh, this one, uh, is, um, is the value of the mutual information between uh, the variable x0 and uh, uh, the target feature. And this one is the conditional mutual information according to variable x1 and x0. Uh, always, th um, always taking into consideration the target variable, of course. So this is how it looks like, basically. And in, you will see that always uh, we can just simply remove this part here because it is symmetric because uh, the, the mutual information between variable X, uh, the, I mean, the, what we want to have is that the matrix is symmetric and therefore uh, this can be deployed in our quantum annealers. And, of course, uh, we have uh, some um, algorithms uh, that can be used uh, that are, let's say, more classical. Simulating the kneeling is another classical algorithm which does not uh, run on quantum computers, but is just an optimization algorithm, algorithm that will run just here on this machine that we provide you. And this will serve as uh, a way for you to understand whether the problem that you, uh, th uh, the formulation that you have in mind works or not, but also to compare how much time it takes for simulated annealing, how the solution are worse or better with respect to quantum annealing. 
which is actually using quantum annealers rather than simulated annealing, which is just using your, uh, uh, your own computer. So it is pretty simple. We have simulated, we create a sampler, which will read 2000 solutions from your own formulation. And in this case, as you will see, you will have to put one, which is the feature selection task. In, since I told you that I created a test task just for showing you how everything is working, this test task is just uh, the te uh, label 10. So this is, but in your case, it will be just one or two. And then you can just type whatever you want. So this is just a sort of description of your submission. Now we run it and it will be done in just a few time. And now we print the response. And as you see, uh, the feature selection algorithm considered all the variables. So um, what we have is that it tells us, okay, uh, you should consider all the variables in your final subset of features because this is the best solution. And 2000 times, this solution has been sampled. Uh, why? And that's because uh, if you go, if we go back here in the mutual information, we see that we have this minus sign. This is because uh, quantum, um, the in quantum, sorry, in cubo formulations, uh, uh, we have to so uh, the cubo formulation uh, that we have uh, to to the, to be solved in quantum annealers are minimization problems because we want to find the minimum energy of the system that is created inside the quantum uh, annealer. And therefore, uh, the idea is that if we have this minus sign, then we will always have um, that the contributions of the features uh, will bring the uh, energy down at the end. And therefore, the, the final solution is just to keep them all so that we have uh, the, the, the lowest energy possible. To solve this issue, since we're working with quadratic unconstrained binary optimization problems, we can just use uh, some soft constraints uh, to, to tell um, the, to formulate the optimization problem such that we keep a given amount of features. And in this case here, you can see that, for example, the penalty can be formulated in this way. And as you can see, for example, when we select key out of k out of uh, the n features, uh, this, sum, this sum will be zero, and therefore the problem will be minimized in that specific case. If the uh, feature selected, so which basically means um, each feature is just a value zero and one, okay? So if we sum uh, a, a one, it means that the feature is kept and zero, the feature is removed. Uh, sorry for not mentioning that uh, earlier. So. If we have that uh, the feature xi is one, which means that it is kept, so the feature, the ith feature is kept, and uh, all the features are kept, so n features are kept, we will have that n minus k is, of course, greater than zero, and therefore uh, the final solution uh, we, we, uh, will, um, will, will be worse with respect to choosing exactly k features. And this is what we are doing uh, right now. Uh, in this case, we have a specific function that already does everything for us, uh, which is uh, combinations, which basically keeps uh, k out of the variables that we have in our problem. And if we run it once again, oh, sorry, of course, I have to put 10 uh, here. As you can see, otherwise it would give you an error. Uh, you will put one because you're working on feature selection. Here I'm using the test task once again. And now we will see how the problem has been formulated. And as you can see that it has been completely changed with respect to what we had before. Now the cube matrix with the constraints looks like this. And if we print resp the response data, we can see that, for example, these are all the features that have been uh, kept. So we kept four features. In our case, we decided to keep four features. So as you can see here, k equals to four. And these are the features that have been removed. 
And we have several and several possible answers, several samples, as you can see. So we have sampled this solution 11 times with this um, corresponding um, associ this, uh, associated uh, energy. And uh, so this one is likely to be the best solution since it has the lowest amount of energy possible. Now, everything was looking great, but now let's go on with quantum annealing. So what we can do is just to, to import the, the web inspector, which is the inspector tool that will allow us to see how the program was actually deployed inside the processing unit, the quantum processing unit of quantum annealers. And uh, here we can just, once again, put 10. And if we run this cell, this cell will actually um, uh, start uh, working from this specific problem, uh, which will be sent uh, across the network to this, uh, uh, this data center where the quantum annealing is stored. The problem will be enqueued because there are lots of researchers working with these technologies. So uh, the enqueuing time may vary. And then your problem will be sent back to you. There is also an additional step in between, which is also known as minor embedding, because uh, from the uh, cubometrics that you have, so uh, the, the problem that you have here can be seen as a graph in which you have basically each variable which is connected with himself in the diagonal and with other variables um, uh, on, uh, on, the other, uh, on the other cell of the metrics. Basically, this can be the, the, this problem will be mapped to the QPU. But since the QPU has a limited number of qubits and interconnections between them, uh, we have this problem that is called embedding, which uh, basically converts the graph that we have here to the graph that we have in our QPU. This is actually a pretty complex problem. But this is solved um, using these, uh, em uh, these embedding composite heuristics, for example, which does everything already for you. So you do not have to worry about it. Uh, keep in mind that it is still a really complex problem that needs to be solved inside your own uh, computer. However, uh, we have to say that usually different embeddings do not influence the solution too much in principle. Uh, so we can just relax a little bit in this sense. And now we will see uh, what I mean with embedding the problem. Now we will see that the solutions have changed a little bit. So we have some features here, some features there. And if you print the info, you can see that, for example, uh, the, um, uh, the overall, uh, uh, we have lots of different uh, timings, the idea of the problem, the label of the problem, and uh, other things that you might want to consider. But specifically, uh, we're interested in the access time, which is the time that you consume from your own quota. And uh, uh, this is the, um, the time that was uh, being used uh, when uh, um, uh, the actual needing time, let's say, uh, so the time that was used for sampling all your own solutions. Okay. And everything is uh, in microseconds. So these are two, uh, 250 milliseconds. And now if we want to uh, print, to show uh, the, um, how it looks like. So you will have, uh, in this case, it won't be uh, available here, but you can just click here. And ta-da, you have the inspector working. Um, so basically this is how, how uh, the, the, your uh, problem looked like basically. And this is how it has been deployed on the QPU. So the QPU, which is once again, the quantum processing unit is the, the processor, the brain of the quantum computer is this stuff here. And it has 5,000 qubits more or less, but here it is how the problem was embedded inside of it. So now you have that the variable uh, age, as you can see, has been embedded in the qubit number 4632. 
and it is connected with this variable here, Mister, which has been uh, deployed in the two, three, three, four node, and so on. So this is basically the idea. And yeah, just to to tell you. So, for example, sometimes you might see these warnings, and this is because, for example, in some cases, since each qubit can be connected to at most a given amount, a given number of variables, sometimes they need to be replicated so that, for example, if you're uh, in this case, we have miss. And if we uh, go, not this one, let's see which one is the e problem. This one, maybe, no. Mr. Cabin age, fair, Mr. Oh, maybe this one. Yeah, as you can see, uh, here you have the miss variable, which is being replicated once again here. And this is because uh, this variable uh, is uh, was um, uh, we didn't have enough connections, and therefore this variable has been replicated here so that it is connected to other possible variables. We have this warning because, as you can see, the value for the solution in this case for miss is one, while for this specific case is minus one or zero, in the case of uh, Qbos. A minus one in the case of housing uh, problems, uh, which is another type of version, another type of formulation, uh, similar to BQM and to Qubus. Uh, so in this case, uh, we can have some problems with the solution that we retrieve. And these kind of problems might arise when uh, there are some, uh, uh, for example, some um, uh, interferences, or some noises inside the TPU. So even small thermal uh, fluctuations or electromagnetic interferences can be a problem in this case. And here we have also uh, all our solutions sampled. So we can see that this is the, the um, solutions that have been uh, the, the best one in terms of energy, minus 187. However, this one had some warnings, uh, as you can see. Here is minus 183.917 and, uh, and so on. So here we have, here we try to plot the same exact thing as before. Uh, so what can be seen here, we try to see here, to see it here with a comparison between simulated annealing and quantum annealing. And finally, here, if you want, you can play with a random classifier that will try to, for example, uh, learn according to the features that we chose. And as you can see, if uh, with the features chosen by quantum annealing, uh, um, the classifier will, be, will have a higher performance with respect to the features chosen just by looking at the mutual, inform the mutual information between each feature and the target. So with a, without also the conditional mutual information that we are exploiting in our problem. How a, a submission looks like, it is nothing more than that. So read the data set, formulate your problem, and then submit it according to uh, the specific format that you have uh, sp uh, that is specified here. So sorry, once again, go back home. As you can see, uh, this is how the format should be, uh, how, how the file should be named. And here you have all the specifications according to it, for example. So it's nothing more than that. So you just send a problem, try to solve it, you get the solution and your work is done. Just place your, sub your, sub your submission inside of here and it's done. Pretty easy. Uh, so once again, the, the contributions that you should do is just try to understand whether, for example, mutual information is a good idea in general, but also try to apply some other techniques such as the Pearson correlation, which is still a way to measure, for example, the correlation between features or other possible ideas that may uh, come to your uh, come up to your mind. Uh, since we are running out of time, uh, we are going to briefly see uh, 
this part here. So we copy and paste it down here. Okay, sorry, it takes a while. Also because uh, the Amazon cloud server is located in, um, in, uh, uh, in, a, um, in the US and uh, therefore, oh, sorry, I copied the wrong one, sorry. Uh, and therefore this can take a little bit sometimes. Okay, better. So in this case, we have a notebook that uh, shows you how to perform, for example, uh, the chemedoids using quantum annealing. Um, in this case, we, 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 we provide you an intuition why uh, the classical chemi formulation is not uh, the best idea in our case. And this is because um, we, this would require to have many uh, variables uh, uh, too many variables in the sense that the number of variables is depend, depend depends also on the number of clusters that we want to have. While a better formulation using uh, uh, key, uh, key medoids allow us to have a number of variables that is not depend that does not depend on the number of clusters that we want to have as it happens in uh, key means, but it depends just on the number of points, documents that we want to cluster. So in this case, we have this sort of formulation and you can uh, see uh, uh, how the key problem is being formulated in general. And here formulation is a little bit more tricky, but there is a paper that uh, can help you with that. And there, uh, we should have pointed the reference here, here. And maybe there is also the link somewhere, but otherwise you can just look for that. Mm. But basically there is a paper showing that, that this formulation with these penalties and coefficients uh, is, works well. And we were going to use this formulation and we tried to formulate it using uh, Python. So once again, we try. Okay, so in this, in this case, for example, we can see that it asks us to choose the kernel. So in this case, I choose this one. Okay, and we import libraries. In this case, we are not considering a data cell at all, but we are just considering random 2D points uh, just for simplicity and to show you that things are working. So the idea is that uh, after computing these functions that we defined up here, and the idea is simply that we want to, uh, to minimize the distance between the points in the same cluster and to maximize the distance between the points belonging to different clusters. This is the general idea of this uh, function. And if you're able to compute uh, coefficients for the cubometrics as in this case, as we did before for mutual information, which is just about some mathematics, but nothing too complex is we are still working with quadratic terms, uh, uh, not uh, so, so difficult terms. So we have our algorithm here that basically formulates our cubometrics, then converts it to BQM, which is the standard form, which is one of the um, standard format accepted by uh, quantum annealers. But you can also submit cubos if you prefer. It's the same. You just have to. Uh, change the possible function to change the function from sample to sample cubo. It's the same. And in this case, we have to place 10 here rather than 2, but you will have to use 2 if you're working with clustering. So now the function is defined. And here we have uh, some functions because at the end of the day, the formulation that you provided we'll have that each variable uh, will represent each one of the points in our cluster. So it will have a variable for each one of these points, which will be set to one if this uh, point is a medoid, zero if this point is not a medoid. So uh, the clusters will be computed afterwards, but, the, uh, but this is pretty uh, fast to be done. Uh, in, in this case, we are just computing the medoids for our clusters um, 
with the quantum uh, algorithm. Then we have some plotting functions and also some silhouette coefficients over there. So as you can see, if we try to uh, run this problem for several times for a key from three to six, uh, we see that, for example, this will be the methods chosen in the case of k equals to three, k equals to four, k equals to five, k equals to six. And here are the silhouette coefficients associated to that. And here, if we install scikit-learn extra, we'll have the key methods available also from a classical algorithm. And we will try to do the same exact thing with the classical algorithms. And we will see, for example, that here are the methods chosen and so on. Then we can plot the silhouettes uh, coefficients. And we can see that, for example, uh, the quantum coefficients are uh, it's a little bit better in these cases, while the classical algorithm is better in those two cases. Similar, our real submission works like this. So you read the data set, which is a data set that can be read according to this, um, this specific uh, functions here that are defined here. So for example, if you try to uh, read these data set of documents, which are just documents, converted to embeddings uh, you go uh, you copy this function here you place it for example in the bottom here uh, code the data set is this one so we copy the path uh, which is uh, slash data sets slash task two slash okay and if you run the cell, of course, I wrote the path in the wrong way. Okay, yeah, sorry, my bad. Um, you can see that, for example, we have six, roughly 6,500 documents. Each one has been turned into embeddings. And these embeddings will be clustered inside your space. So this one will be your points. Each one of them is just a point a variable in your clustering algorithm. And then these variables will be used to uh, get some, uh, to, to understand whether the clustering algorithm worked well using some uh, unsupervised learning uh, evaluation measures. And then uh, we will also try to match the, these embeddings with some query embeddings to see whether uh, we are able to uh, find uh, relevant um, documents for, que for queries and those documents belong to the same clusters. And that's basically it. So one, um, I think we should be finding that uh, once again, just to be clear, the um, what you are expect. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, please start working on on because of course uh, time is uh, flying fast and the deadline is soon approaching. Uh, so please, uh, we hope to see some submissions uh, and. Uh, if you have any sort of issues, just tell us and we will be happy to help you out. But as you can see, most of the things have been already done. It's just using a different data set. We already created all the functions uh, for, uh, for everything. So if you want to start with mutual information or with the other clustering, you can just go through that. Of course, clustering is a little bit too, is a little bit complicated because what you will have to do is to uh, cluster several and several times because you cannot do everything in one step. So you have to do some sort of hierarchical clustering approach, uh, but this is done outside of quantum. Quantum can just be used, for example, to, uh, to make these small clusters with a small number of points and then outside the compute the small, the actual big clusters, for example. Um, 
so th this is basically it at the end the final contribution in case of uh, especially in case of feature selection is just to decide how to put these numbers inside the metrics so uh, if you use the uh, mutual information the mutual information between uh, each one of the features if you want to use the Pearson correlation is the Pearson correlation between the features and the target and so on so yeah it's not so hard uh, in, in this sense because it's not about quantum physics it's just about putting numbers inside the matrix at the end of the day um, however what's really interesting is that we are doing it with a different we are solving it with a different paradigm which is actually uh, really innovative and hopefully it will be it will get but it will be helpful to to get some real groundbreaking results in the future so once again um, thank you for your attention if you have any sort of uh, uh, questions or whatever just please ask us uh, and we will be happy to help you when See you soon, uh, hopefully, and yeah, I hope that uh, you will uh, you will be able to do some submissions so that uh, we will be able to evaluate how quantum uh, anything can actually uh, work in our field. Thank you very much once again, and see you uh, see you or uh, in the future.